Drugs don't know your social status, your nationality, or the color of your skin. They just don't discriminate. They don't care what your social status is. They don't care about any of that. And on this cold Chicago day, the warmest place to be was the Greyhound bus station. And that's exactly where Janice found herself, willing to give life one more chance. She'd been in and out of seven different treatment centers. And you know, when I was in those treatment centers, I was always going to be the one to succeed. I was always going to be the one that was going to do better. And I was always the one that relapsed. And it was there that David Beatty showed up in his green military jacket, ready to give Janice a ride to the treatment home. But it wasn't happily ever after. You see, David wouldn't let her husband into the truck because he was clearly still under the influence. This stranger represented the help she needed, but to trust him meant leaving her husband behind, who she loved. When there seems to be no hope left, where do you turn? Can this power of human connection transform an otherwise impossible situation into renewed life and sense of purpose and meaning? The answers to those questions are revealed through the story of Janice and David on today's episode of Altered Life. Why do you think it was that, uh, you know, you had a propensity to, to relapse? What do you think it was? I think I was always expected to be somebody other than myself. But there's a, you know, the human reward of watching somebody just grow. It is. It's addictive. Talk about addiction. That's, it's addictive. It's a better form. Better watch, form. Watch people, yeah. like, discover. It is amazing. It is so rewarding. Yeah, it's crazy. And you can't count it in your bank account. It's a, it's a, it's, it's beyond that. Well, welcome, Dave and Janice. Welcome to the Altered Life podcast. I'm uh, very honored, happy that you're here to share your li- your life stories, and more importantly, the life story of how you guys got connected and uh, the positive things that have happened as a result of you know, just getting connected in the right way. Uh, somebody who's seeking help, somebody who's willing to give the help and the radical transformation and the uh, just the, the compounding effect that can have on the world. And we were just talking about how the it's world so- is somewhat disconnected and uh, it's, it's not easy to reach out. It's not easy to connect. And so we want to help people mm-hmm. you know, be willing to connect, be willing to reach out in that moment of need. And so uh, Janice and Dave, I want to know about your story. Like, um, Dave, tell me, tell me a little bit about your background and, and what led you into, you know, wanting to be a help giver and be, you know, be a resource for those that are in need. How did that happen? Tell me about that. It was a series of sort of, I, I guess it started like on 1996, I had a, you know, when you do your New Year's Eve like I want to do this and do that. Jane. Resolution. Yeah. I never could do it. I still smoke. You know, it's a just. I, I just give up that. But one of the things I did that year was I said, and it just came out of me. I said, I, I want to start some transitional housing for um, women because there wasn't any available in our area. Oh, wow. What year was that? And, and I just wrote it on a piece of paper. I think that was 1996. 1996. So that just like was a planting a seed. I didn't do anything with it. I just kept on doing what I think I was moving furniture and, you know, tr- trying to finish uh, going to school. And anyway, I had a family. And so that just sat there and uh, things evolved. And, and and I got a job at a community mental health in Lansing, Michigan. And uh, it was an outreach worker. So my job was to work homeless shelters, people getting out of jail, prison, and help them basically what Janice is just talking about there, help them access resources. And, but there wasn't any resources. There was mm-hmm. no. Back then, there wasn't many. There wasn't a lot. No, there was yeah. nothing. So mm-hmm. if you got out and you're a carpenter, you got a job, and you don't have a, a tool belt, or you went to jail in the in the spring and you, you get out in the winter, you need a coat, work boots, you know, personal hygiene. There's a lot of people that are homeless when they go to treatment, we're getting out, they didn't have anything when they got back. Yeah, we call that social determinants of health now, right? Just the basic necessities, right? right? Yeah. So I started, I, you know, I started collecting pop bottles, and my grandson was helping me, and then somebody donated a couple hundred bucks. We filed a uh, 
a corporation, nonprofit corporation. I'm still working this job as an outreach, right? And But in the back of my mind was 1996 and what I wrote on that piece of paper. I still have it somewhere. It's on a yellow piece of lined paper. Wow. So in 2002, I filed that corporation. And nine months later, I had a 501c3 nonprofit status. And then two years later, I mean, so I started getting money for those shoes and personal hygiene items and, you know, uh, the odd when I really needed to hustle the money, you know, somebody that needed a tooth extracted. Mm-hmm. So I, I made relationships with dentists and um, uh, or oral surgeons, you know, whatever. I was, a, uh, I I would hit them up in their heart. Look, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. Got somebody here. They're trying to get a job. They, the base face is swollen. You know. Anyway, I was a hustler. Yeah. Too. You know. Yeah. So. Doing whatever it took. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Anyway, 2004. This guy, a wealthy guy decided he wanted to buy some houses and do what we're doing. But he didn't want to do it himself. And he had a lot of money and it was a tax deal. He's trying anyway, he he bought three houses and everybody at that meeting, I was the only one that had a five oh one C three. So I he was I was the only one useful to him, right? Yeah. Because he needed a real estate deal. So, you know, and that's how I ended up. I had three houses. So Janice was one of those people in the early days. I think it was 2004 or five. When, Janice, when was it? It was 2005. Yeah. 2005. She, was, she was my first round of people that came to those houses. Yeah. So I'm going to let Janice wow. tell you that's how that started. Yeah. Janice, so tell me about, you know, share with us where were you? Like, how did. What did, where were you at when you reached out today for help? And maybe, you know, let's tell the background. Like, where were you before? I was in my, oh, maybe about my seventh treatment center, my last treatment center. Um, and it was supposed to be a 28-day program. My counselor kept me there for 72 days because they could not find a place for me to go. So she called me into the office one day and she said, we're going to pay your first month's rent at this place. It's a halfway house for you to go and stay. He said, the gentleman is going to pick you up at the Greyhound bus station. His name is Dave Beatty. That's all she told me. She didn't tell me how he was going to look, what he was. So I get to the bus station and there's this Caucasian man with a green army jacket and a pickup truck. And my husband was at the bus station also. You remember that day? And he was very under the influence that day. And he wanted a ride with Dave. And Dave was like, no, I can't take you with me. And so me and Dave got in the car and he took me to Joe and Shirley's house which was my home for almost a year. Uh, While I was at Joe and Shirley's, I decided that I wanted to go back to school. So we had to go to meetings every day, at least one. I went to two. I used to get up in the morning and go down the street to the East Club, the West Club. And they had a meeting at 8 o'clock every morning. And then in the evening, I would go to St. Lawrence Hospital at 7 o'clock to the N.A. meeting. So that became my ritual for the next five years of my life. That really set the foundation. So I went back to school. I had never been to college before. So at 52, I'm enrolling in college. You didn't go to college till nine till you're fifty two years old. Did I hear that right? I did not go to college until I was fifty two years wow. old. Wow! And did you have a high school diploma, or were you? I did have a high school okay. diploma. That was um, essential in my mom and dad's house call. You must graduate from high school. Now, whatever you want to do after that was up to you, but it was mandatory that you did that. So I did have a high school diploma. So I went to college. I got my associates, my bachelor's. By the time I was 60, I had my master's degree. While I was at Joe and Shirley's, I did not have an income. So what I used to do was advocate for services for the houses so that I was able to pay my rent. So people would come and I think I got some carpet, 
We got some gift cards for from Walmart with very substantial amounts. We got window treatments. I think we got some appliances. We were able to get some really good resources while we were Now, was there. this time when you're doing this, going to any lengths is what I hear, necessary, right? Uh, was this right. at a time when most people would think, well, my life is, you know, pretty much over, right? Like, yeah, and there's no hope for me. Absolutely. Was, was Dave there? I've had that said to me so many times, Michael. So many times I have had people say to me, you wasted your whole life. You have just destroyed yourself. What do you say to them yep. when you say, when, when they say that, when they said that to you? At the beginning, I had absolutely nothing to say to them. I would just be encouraged by the fellowship and the meetings that I went to and my own self-determination to keep moving forward. Because there is a time when you look at your life and where you are and you think that those words are really true. You have wasted your life. Maybe you don't have another chance to get it together because... It seems like you've had so many chances. Yeah, you know? and all the evidence sort of backs that up too, right? That, yeah, that Absolutely. you have like not done well Absolutely. with your life. And how did you? Yeah, how did you get the just the inspiration and the determination to to start putting your life on a different course? What what was that thing? How did that happen? My real foundation and support was Joe and Shirley's house. And the NA Fellowship, that was my, the people that were in my life were all people that were in recovery. And so we bonded together every day. Every day we met each other at the meetings. And that connection, right? That connection of being with people that uh, were on a similar journey that genuinely cared for you. Maybe they didn't have all the answers of the solutions, but- just the support that 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 made a big difference yes. in your life is that is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And Dave, Absolutely. Dave, looking at uh, you know Janice's story, and you were you know a, a big part of this story. How did you know, what did you see in Janice that you know? Did you have an indication that there's something different here? Something good is going to happen here? Did you have a belief, or was it like, oh no, she's you know, she's hopeless too. There's not much, not much chance for her. What, what were you thinking at this time? Cause you were there when this was going on. I had just treated Janice like people had treated me. I mean, mm-hmm. you're special. No doubt about it. I just adore you. Clearly. But mm-hmm. the truth is, is I didn't know her. It was a, a blank slate. Yeah. But my thing was the phone rang and there's a woman named Janice. Yeah, I don't know who she was, where she came from, her background, but um, that that's why I went to pick her up. Because you were just that, just what you're you were yeah. called to do, right? That's just what you were doing. Yeah, that's what yeah. I was. That's what I was doing. And, yeah, and that's how my life got saved, right. basically. You know, some stranger right. helped me. But anyway, I I you know, you got to tell him though. Ron wanted to get in the truck, your husband, and I said no. Because I didn't know the situation, right? If it's domestic violence or what, absolutely. So I said, "No, absolutely. You stay here. And I'll so come back." Me and my husband. What's that? We have the same clean time. My clean date is in January. His is in February, because Dave helped to get him into the VA treatment program, and I think Ron stayed there for three days. And, but Dave did, hadn't had good experience with couples at his recovery homes. So we had to sort of convince Dave that we were not going to be a problem to him in order for my husband to come and stay in the men's house because we had one women's house and two houses for men. And so Dave agreed to let my husband yeah. come. Now, in. wait, now you're telling me so you're telling then, me you're getting you're trying to get help. Uh, this. This white guy in a in a in a green jacket in a pickup truck tells you, <laughs> "Okay, I'll help you, but we're gonna have to do something else with your husband." What what was it about yeah. like that proposition, which isn't easy, 
what what about that proposition made you think okay let's try this why what was it at the time do you know i don't know i guess dave saw something in ron that he also saw in me and he just wanted to give us a chance because i think he had came across some very not so nice situations involved with people in relationships being in the houses. But I think maybe because Ron and I were older and more settled, and I think we were really serious about changing our lives. And I think Dave saw that. In no, us. Thank God that you did that, Janice. Can I ask you, what, Absolutely. so what, uh, what was life like before you, you know, you found the, um, the opportunity for help, you know, where were you in your life? What did you, what was it like back then? Yeah. Life, you know, you you come to the part in your life, Michael, where you have burnt all your bridges. People may have still have hope for you, but they don't want to do anything for you because you have bit the hand that has tried to help you so many times until people just step away because they're tired. And that's your story. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more. Do you mind telling me a little bit more about your story, your journey? Nope. So I come from a two-parent family. There were three of us, me, my brother, and my sister. My brother is deceased now. It's just me and my sister. I have two daughters who are very successful in what society compares with life. Oldest one is a doctor, and my youngest one is a supervisor for the Chicago public school system. So they've done well for themselves. And they don't want to have anything to do with anybody that has any substance abuse problem, which means using, selling, whatever. That is not a part of their story. They do not want to have it anything to do with anybody like that. I am blessed because those relationships have been mended and it wasn't easy. And I'm still mending those relationships because it can be a situation. It can be a song. It can be a phrase that somebody says that triggers feelings in people. So I have to be able to allow my children to say how they feel. It's no longer about me because I've come to the point where does it still bother me? Sometimes. Is it true? Absolutely. And accepting the truth sometimes can be kind of yes. hard. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's yeah. stuff that was done back then that we can't deny. And to deny it would just hurt them more. Absolutely. Right? It would just hurt them more. Absolutely. But your love, your love so, for them just sort of uh, overcomes all that, I would imagine. Right? Like you're. Right. That's what drives you. And I was raised in the church. And my experimenting with drugs started on the weekend. You know, Friday and Saturday, you know, when you first start off, you can kind of contain it for a little bit. And then it started in the morning before I went to work. And then it became after I got off of work. And pretty soon, guess what? I wasn't going to work because I was looking for something to make me feel different. Well, different. you didn't have traditional work. That became work, right? For for those of us who know Absolutely. what that cycle's like, it becomes it Absolutely. becomes work. Yeah. So then there were years of in and out of treatment centers. You're gonna do this and you and you know, when I was in those treatment centers, I was always gonna be the one to succeed. I was always gonna be the one that was gonna do better. And I was always the one that relapsed. Always. And many other people have that story too. Why do you think, why do you think it was that, uh, you know, you had a propensity to, to relapse? What do you think it was? Why, why was that? I think I was always expected to be somebody other than myself. You know, I think. Um, people had these great expectations for me, but I didn't have those expectations for me because I knew what I was. 
You had shame? You and had I shame? You had shame? Do you think it was shame? I think it was shame and guilt. And I think that I had come to the conclusion that I couldn't live life without using drugs. I just really believed that I could not stop using because I tried so many times and, and failed. What do you think? What do you think you had reached out for drugs in the first place? I mean, what do you think was the driving force behind that? You've had plenty of time for introspection and, and you know, to ponder that. What do you think it was? I think it was uh, more so peer pressure and wanted to fit in because, I, like I told you, I was raised in the church and my, you know, we lived in a no-nonsense household. And we had to be in at a certain time. Like, I didn't go to dances and stuff like uh, the other kids did. So I really didn't get any freedom until I was graduated from high school. Yeah, so you got that freedom, and it was like, let me see what I can do with it, right? I've Absolutely. I've been, I've been living on this, uh, on this restricted lifestyle for too long. I want to live a little bit, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. And then my oldest daughter, she was born when I was 20. I got married right after she was born. And by the time she was two, I was a widower. So I think that's why the addiction continued also because I was trying to hurt, cover up those feelings. And it just escalated. You know, when you tell, when people tell you that it's like a snowball, it's like a, it's a snowball effect. And it just continues until it's just out of control. So you lost your way. You started, you said at 20, you had, you had a daughter, you lost your, your husband, and then you didn't find Dave until you're how old? Until I was 52. Wow. So you had 32 years in between. Right. And in those 32 years, I might have had two years clean time. Maybe. And those two years clean time was in a facility because it was like once I got out and I was able to make my own decisions, I just couldn't do it. Wow. How desperate did you get? I mean, how I much just could not stay? Clean. How much did the like how how dark did it get for you? Like how how desperate did you get? It was a life that I would not want to wish on my worst enemy. And I don't have any enemies. <laughs> what a miracle you are. So you, you reach out, you get Dave. Dave, so what do you see from, from that point after, you know, Janice and you connected? What do you, you know, what are you, what are you doing? Like, what are you, where are you at with helping Janice on and her husband on their journey to, you know, finding a better place in life? They fit into a whole, at the time, I think we had 24 yeah. residents there and people coming and going. So yeah. they only got a certain amount of my attention. It's not like, don't let it appear right. like they had, you know, my hands on attention because I you had a lot, too much going, had a lot on. going yeah. on. Yeah. But what I did observe was whenever I looked, you know, that the, what she described she was doing, she was hustling for money for us, you know, for, for uh, donations and, mm -hmm. um, fundraising and there was a lot going on and ron was just he her husband was just paying attention to his own his business pretty much he he uh he was struggling with his own demons you know yeah and uh so but so it's not like i just you know this is there was a lot going on it was crazy i mean a house 24 brand new recovering people is not a boring time yeah, there's a yeah. lot, a lot of action. Yeah. <laughs> People relapsing and using and lot, lot of stuff and having sex and you know whatever going on mm -hmm. in relationships and but but once you built a and these guys were really important for this. Once you build a over the fifty percent line of people that want to change their lives, then the energy changes. But until then, whenever you don't know what's gonna and the, and all the residents, the group, yeah, the group but, starts but once to, Ron and Janice is as an example. And like I said, you get a little over 50%. So did they start becoming like your anchors? Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Yeah, I mean, yeah. they were doing their own thing, but at the same time, they were an example. Mm -hmm. So, and they paid, I mean, they weren't the boss or anything, but you guys had no problem telling people what you thought. Like, 
or what you didn't think. They didn't come running to me about stuff. Yeah. They didn't handle it themselves. You know? Yeah. But I watched them, you know, like she did get it. She started going to school, got a job. Um, I think Ron was on disability. Am I, am I correct? Right? Yeah. Yes. But, yeah. And within a year, they got their first apartment and. And moved out? And moved out. <laughs> yeah. And by the time I, I don't know, you moved to Chicago, what, six, seven years ago? They, you sold your you no, sold your house and we, moved we, to Chicago. They bought a house. You yes, bought a house. Yes, it's about six to seven years. It was in 2018. Yeah, so we sold our house and moved to. What do you mean you sold a house? You would have to buy a house to sell a house. Yeah, yeah, these guys went from. Wait a second. Wait, we're missing a. You're jumping over a whole day, thing here. All of a sudden, they're selling houses. Janice, <laughs> and they go from Janice, being picked up at the Greyhound bus station to selling houses. Wait, Janice, do you remember when we went to go get here. your belongings? For you and Ron, yes. they had like I think there was thirteen yeah. garbage bags. That was everything you owned in your no life. No way. Yeah. So absolutely. So on, but then they absolutely. had to hire a moving truck to move your stuff to Chicago, right? From the house you just sold. Yeah. So that journey, that absolutely. journey to going from is this a gray house, Greyhound bus station? I'm I'm seeing in my mind. Is that right? A Greyhound bus station. That's what yeah, it was. I, I remember those places. There's less of them now, but I remember there used to be a lot of them when I was young. Uh, and those weren't a place you wanted to hang out. That's not a place you wanted to really end up at, you know? It was the only warm place. Right? <laughs> yeah, no. that was a warm place, though, <laughs> when you're really down and out. Absolutely. Yeah, but so you go from, you know, ending up in basically the sober living environment with Dave. A year later, you get an apartment with your husband. What an amazing story. Then what happens after that? Because you, you didn't go right to selling houses. You had to buy a house before you could sell a house. How did you get the no, resources? So we get, we, we the most the important yeah. thing of that apartment yeah. is that Dave co-signed for wow. that apartment for I us. That. Wow. He believed in us just that much that he was willing to put his name on a legal document so that we can get our apartment. We we lived we lived in the um Chicago State, I'm sorry, Michigan State is there. And so the way that we furnished our apartment was they put new furniture in those dorms every year and they put the old furniture out on the curb. So we went there and we got furniture. People from the fellowship gave us furniture. And that was how we furnished our first apartment. Amazing. And it was a really nice apartment. Was it, it not, was. Dave? Yeah. Beautiful. It was. Yeah. So a year after we get into the apartment, my husband's mother passes away. Mm. It is her wishes that everything be liquidated and divided between her three children. My mind said to me, you're in trouble because money tells you that you can get high with no consequences. I was so petrified, you guys, that Ryan and I were going to relapse. I didn't know what to do. I told him, you got to do something. You got to give that money to somebody. You got to put it in a trust. You got to put it in somebody's name because I know how distorted your thinking can become once you get the ways and means in your hand to get high without consequences. But we came through that and we didn't use. We moved to a bigger, better apartment, and we bought some more furniture, and we got some cars, and I graduated from college, and Ron got a part-time job as a counsel, um, substance abuse counselor, and life was good. You realize you're telling, like, this miraculous story, don't you? You realize you're telling, like, you know, that this thing should be a book. It could be a movie. You... uh it could. You, you realize that, right? It could. Uh, Janice, what you're leaving out is how many people, far more than me, you guys, I mean, you guys touched a lot of lives. In other words, you kept paying it forward and paying it forward. When we first came into recovery, those people are still in our lives today. What a gift. <laughs> I have a best friend. You remember Crystal? Crystal just celebrated 
13 or 14 years clean, Crystal was one of those people that you think she's never coming in. She's never going to stay clean. Not only did she get clean, her and her husband just moved to Scottsdale, Arizona. She has a job working in the hospital. I'm talking about somebody that doesn't have a high school diploma. God is so amazing. Good. Isn't that true? He is just so awesome. If you just stay committed to not picking up, that's our thing. We just got to learn how not to pick up, not to substitute one thing for another. Not to want to use. When I think about using drugs, I think of nothing good. Nothing good is going to come out of that. When I think of picking up a pill or a rock or whatever the substance might be, I know that nothing's good is going to come out of that. Nothing. 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 Right. Our history, our experience tells us that, you know, uh, something that is impacting me right now, looking at you and hearing your story and knowing your your upbringing, uh, I, I can't, I, I bet you, and I don't even know you, but I know countless times when you were out there on the street doing your thing, someone would tell you, Janice, what are you doing here? You don't even belong out here. And you knew, you oh, knew. Oh my goodness, Michael, were you there? So many people you know, told me you that. Know in your heart, <laughs> were you there? You know in your heart. <laughs> that that was true. And look at you on the other side. You Absolutely. know how I know that? Because that happened to me too. Absolutely. And you, you know, it's, a, it's, like, it's like God trying to speak to you, uh, you know, the world trying to send you the signal that get out of this path. Come on, you can do it. Even when you don't have hope for yourself, even in the darkest times, you know, the world's sending you these messages. God's sending you these messages to kind of tap you on the shoulder. And I can just see it in you. I can't even imagine how many times you heard that. And that stuck with you, didn't it? I mean, it, it did, didn't it? Absolutely. It did. And that probably is part of what, Absolutely. that's part of what all of the accumulation of all those times that you were reached out to like that, you know, in the, in the back of your mind sort of gave you the strength and the will, the confirmation to do something. And look at how you've turned it around now. You've helped so many people by being willing to respond uh, and being thankful, being grateful for what you've been given. And you've worked for that. There's no doubt about it. You've yeah. worked really hard for it. Uh, what is this thing about human connection? What do you guys think this is? I mean, why does this, why is it that, you know, we can come together and I'll say this, the, I'll, I'm going to state the obvious. I'm going to be a little bit controversial, but you guys aren't from the same walks of life. You know, you, you, you know, you're, you're from, you know, Anglo America and black America, but you know, I find that this thing of human connection is no respecter. It doesn't matter what life, what walk of life we're more, we're more similar than we are different. You know, if we really, if we were looking in the heart of this whole thing. So I just hate, you know, it's just so sad to see the, uh, the polar polarism that's happening, how polarized we are in this world. And, it's never been, but you know, drugs don't care what color no, you are. No, that's right. They don't care what your nationality <laughs> that's right. is. That's right. They don't care what your social status that's is. Right. They don't care about any that's of that. Right. That's right. And equally, like this power of this love, this human connection, it doesn't care about any of that either, does it? Because look at us, right? Absolutely. Look at us. Look at us. Absolutely. Look at us connecting now on this topic. <laughs> Of what we've all been through and how we are now here at this point, you know, trying to spread the message, not trying, we're spreading the message of hope and love and the power of connection and what this thing can do. What do you think it is about this thing? What do you think it is about this thing? You know, I don't know. And I, it doesn't, it, I don't really understand it. I just know it's a phenomena. I mean, I'm not religious. I, I don't profess to be. Yep. But I was telling somebody this morning, having a dialogue, and I said, you know, I, I I ended up like telling a little story. You know, they asked me to tell them a story, so I did. Yeah. But it was like, what are the odds? Yeah. You know, and so I had an I had an old Indian friend of mine. He was in World War II. He was in the Normandy invasion, and he used to talk in terms of he was Native American. He'd talk about 
how did the salmon know when to head up from the ocean back into the river where they came from? Mm -hmm. Or he'd say, and the best analogy of what we're talking about for me was he would talk about, think of the stars, the so many infinite amount of number of stars. And, and when they cross paths, the, he would use the metaphors. Those are two human spirits. And they might, Beautiful. they might be only for a second that it's meant, or maybe for a lifetime it'll alter. But the fact that they, that energy passed cross paths, it, that's how I look at this stuff with me. I mean, and it's, it has nothing to do with sobriety necessarily or religion or anything, but my experience is if I'm open, I meet people that I never would have fathomed I ever would have met. Isn't that true? And they impact me and I think that so true? It's so know, beautiful. I'm, aw I'm awestruck by it. So it blows it, me away. Well, I mean, if you look at the, the three of us, how do we cross paths, you know? It was yeah. it was one, one stone to another to another. And it, in the chaos of the world, it's, it seems like it's just random, but the the effect that it has is huge, you know? And so I just, you know, I, I'm in awe and I've gotten so I, I'm, I'm very cynical. So I always think, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but sure enough, if, if I'm still breathing, I, I'll see another. It's like you, you want to catch a shooting star mostly right here, like right out of the peripheral vision. Yeah. It's just That's glimpse. the way this happens. All of a yeah. sudden, it's like bumping somebody on the sidewalk and, and, you know, there was something, maybe that meant nothing and maybe it did, but. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but I, I'll, I'll say that you're right about that, but I also say you have to have a, a, a bias toward it. You have to be willing. You have to have a intentional mindset to want to put yourself in a position to help somebody else. I think, I think, you know, I think the, um, the world today, you know, we talk about isolation, social isolation, you know, we're way weaker uh apart we're way stronger together right and so getting in our own uh heads by ourselves we really don't have much strength to overcome those thoughts of shame and worthlessness but you know together we can get outside of our head and connect with each other and help each other along the path uh, i you know part of you know what the mission is of us talking and sharing our message here is we want to give hope and encouragement to both the help giver and the help seeker because even giving a help being a help giver guys it can be draining it could be mm -hmm. it could be it, it's it's a lot right let's be honest it is a lot but it's way worth it right and so for all those help givers that are out there that are you know in this thing helping other people uh you know want to encourage them and those if you're looking for help you know, we want to be encouragers to those too to reach out. What would you say about that, Janice, mm -hmm. from your experience? I think it's um you just gotta be willing to believe because you don't know whether you can really help somebody or not. You can just share with them the knowledge that you have. Show them the kindness that you've been shown. Be willing to, you know, take that extra step for somebody that's hurting. Because regardless of what the situation or circumstances are, that is a hurting individual. So what do you do? Some of them you can help. Some of them you cannot. I'm sure Dave has met a multitude of people that, he believed in that he wanted to help, but for some reason they just didn't want it. That's hard. That That's hard to know that you know that this person has the potential to change, but the pull of the drug or the drink is so much more powerful than the belief that they have in themselves. You know, it, it's not all, you know, have you heard, You've. I'm sure you guys have heard this saying, it's not just the drugs. The drugs was just a symptom of what was really going on inside of us. The hurt, the rejection, the failure. You got to learn how to get over all of that. 
think of the pain that think of the pain that we are carrying around. We're in so much pain as human beings that we will do anything to get away from that pain, including <laughs> and not limited to reaching out for you know some illicit drug in a very dangerous, life threatening form in a you know in an environment that <laughs> we would never want to go to. But we're in so much pain from that thing that's driving us to take that action. That is, that's mm -hmm. the reality, right? So I'm, I'm a big believer. It's not the, it's not the substance. It's really the underlying pain that we got to get to and help people unpack. And absolutely. But if you can just escape, some people feel like if I can just escape this pain for just a few minutes, if I could just get away from it think that it's not there or maybe it'll disappear but no matter how high you go up you got to come down and when you come down that Ooh, same yeah. situation is it's there. true that is so true how do you help people janice with that pain like how do you what's your been what's what's been the formula for you like how do you do that you know i'm more of a listener than an advice giver sometimes people don't want us to give them advice. They just want somebody to listen to them. You know, because so many bridges have been burnt until there's nobody there to listen to them anymore. There's somebody there to tell them what they should or should not do. But a lot of times there's nobody there to listen. Yeah, I think the the, the voice of the the ear giving giving people a voice is equally important as like giving them an ear so they can hear, you know, they know they're heard, right? And you got to be, you got to be, it, when somebody's asking you to listen to their most deepest, darkest, most vulnerable secrets or their experiences, you've got to show up the right way in that moment. Because if you don't show up the right way, you could be compounding the pain you know you could be hurting people even more deeper than you could be doing more harm than good if if you understand what i'm saying right right did you ever experience and, that and when you tried to reach out and track worker says that i can't be trusted so why should they listen to me mm -hmm. yeah was it people that were trying to were they in facilities you know were they in were they help givers or were they just family members usually that were kind of turned off to, to you? It was both. It was both, you know, people that were people that had been where I was, um, family members that were just sick and tired of Janice. You know, it was, it was both. But I think the connection, the strong connection with the fellowship was what really helped me to get to the other side, really. We have a way of wearing out our welcome, don't we, Janice? Yes, we do. <laughs> get left yes, we left do. to our own devices. And you, and you gotta be able to own that, Michael. That's right. You gotta own That's that. That's right. That's real. Yeah, I think I think it wasn't until, yep, you got, until I was able to. Do you know, absolutely. Do you know that it was 10 years before my daughter allowed me to stay in her house by myself? Is that right? Ten years. Wow. Ten years. That trust had to be earned. I had to earn the right to do that. How did, how did you, how did you, why did you go down that path of ten years? A lot of people just give up. They get resentful. They get angry. Why did you? It wasn't, it wasn't my ten years to own, Michael. It was her ten years. Oh, that's beautiful. It was up to her to tell me when it was okay. I had lost the privilege of being her mother. I had destroyed that relationship. So now it was up to me to build that relationship back up. I remember the first time you your daughter and I think it was your sister, they all came to visit mm -hmm. for a weekend. Do you yeah. remember that? And you hung out with yes. them. That was the first time. That was the beginning of that yeah. healing for you. Yeah. So you like what's what's happening now? Like what's life now for each of you? You guys have been through a an amazing journey of being both uh 
help seeker and help givers, right? You, you called out for help at one point in your life too, Dave, I would imagine, right? I did. Yep. yep. And so did I, and so did Janice. But what are you doing now? Like what, what's been on the other side of, of, you know, life uh, after you've, you know, got on this path? What's, what's bring us up to date? Well, it's just, it's real life, right? I mean, people, I, I got divorced, then I got, she, you know, what? She died. And oh, then, yeah. You know, lots yeah. of, I mean, life keeps on happening. Yeah, but it does. I don't, I'm still like a, um, I'm still basically doing the same thing I always did, just in a diff different form of getting paid. When I back those days when Janice was there, I wasn't getting paid for that. And so much paying you now for helping people? So, yeah, I'm actually getting paid for it. Yeah, no, what? But, Tell me a little about uh, that. Tell me a little about that. I, I work for a, a Native American tribe. And, okay. And I spend time, some outreach, and, and and then sending them off to treatment or mental health treatment or whatever they need. So, yeah, I'm doing the same thing. That's fabulous. But in my own personal life, back to those, you know, shooting stars and stuff, I, I look back, I can, if I trace backwards the relationships that even in those hard times, if I hadn't met those people, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. Mm -hmm. You know, I can always do the math backwards. So I don't really understand how it all works. I mean, I, I meet the most amazing people when just when I think there's nothing left to do. <laughs> and find, you know, it just blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, it's <laughs> happening every day for me. That's wonderful. And Janice and I, you know, we've stayed in touch, haven't we? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Janice, what's happening yeah. with you and now? Me, what's going on with you? I'm just living life one day at a time. I lost Ron in April. So that's an adjustment in itself to be living without someone that you've been with for 35 years. So work keeps me, and people always like, uh, how long you got to work? Uh, how, how old are you? Well, why are you still working? Well, I'm blessed that I could still work because when I was working, when I should have been working, I was doing something else. So I'm blessed that God has allowed me to be in somewhat of my right mind, somewhat physically good. I, I battled cancer. I've been cancer free for about seven months now. Um, thank you. And so it, it's just a journey. I have a purpose. I have a purpose when I get up every day, I get to help somebody do something that they're struggling with. I don't have to be judgmental and say whether I think they're right or they're wrong because I'm just doing my job. And I meet some awesome people along the way. You know, the, a lot of these people are what society would consider to be uh, derelict or not favorable or they don't want to be around them or she's got too many kids or he doesn't want to go. I don't have to sit in judgment of anybody. You know what I'm saying? I'm just here to be an avenue to help them to get to a solution to solve whatever problem they have. And it's a better way of existing, isn't it? Living and not being judgmental, not being absolutely, filled with, absolutely with judgment. Absolutely. So there's, there's, yeah, a, absolutely. there's two questions I want to ask each of you, and this is sort of the essence of why we do this podcast. So I'll start with you, Dave. Uh, if you had one thing that you could say as a, a message of inspiration or hope to a help seeker, someone's in desperation right now, what would be that one thing you would tell that person right now that may be listening? I think I would just say, you know, a lot of us believe a lot of things about ourselves and their lies. And so whatever identity you might have right now, that, when you look in the mirror, it doesn't make you happy. You know, you were you were given that, and then you earned some of it. But it doesn't have to be the end of the story. Yeah, you, know, you have the you have it within you to to discover who it was you were really meant to be and who you were going to be. If 
if you can leave this way of life alone long enough to to try something new, and it's going to take some serious courage and a lot of work. But yeah, I guess that's what I'd say is you know how long you want to do this, and if you don't want to do it, you can you can do something else. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I would say. Janice, what would you say to somebody that's in desperate desperation and not certain if they have the courage to reach out and ask for help? But like when you you know when you were at that point, what could you what would you have told yourself even maybe back then? I would tell them that you don't have to do it all at one time. All you got to do is make it through today all you gotta do and that sometimes that's a big order you know if I could just make it through today without putting anything in my body that's a big order so then you break it down to increments let me get through these next 15 minutes let me get through this next hour you gotta find something to substitute for what you used to do because it's not going to just lay there that's void. If you've been getting high for so long, there's a big empty void in your life. You got to fill that up. With yes. That's beautiful. And lastly, Dave, uh, what would you tell a help seeker that is, you know, maybe just not sure if they got what it takes to help? I mean, a help giver, sorry. What would you tell a help giver? who maybe isn't sure they've got what it takes to help somebody. They don't have the courage to help reach out and, and you know, be of service. What would you tell that person? I just feel like if it doesn't fit, then, you know, maybe that's not your line of work. I might tell them that. Yeah. If they ask me, I wouldn't mm -hmm. tell them that unless they ask. But, yeah. but I also had to learn over time that, you know, if I'm spending, how much energy am I going to spend here if someone's not ready to do anything when there's people out here that could maybe benefit? Mm -hmm. And so I've had to learn more about. Um, Choose wisely. Yeah, I mean, just um, the way I am the first round, I'll give you everything I got. Boom, boom, boom. Like if they walk into Janice's office. But. The next round, it's a little bit, you do a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. you know what's going on here. And then the third round or fourth or fifth or sixth, the less I do for them. Yeah. To where they call me and I can't, I won't even buy them a pack of cigarettes. I'm just mm -hmm. like, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. I had to go to work this morning. You go to work. Is that kind of self-preservation too? If you're really honest? Oh yeah. 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 It's like, a, because otherwise it. You it, can't give yourself away. It's the later. cliche, you know, the car before the horse. I, right. I'm out there wanting you to do things more than you want to do them that's right for yourself so yeah, yeah. but yeah. i mean that's that's just comes with time and yeah. some you know experience i guess yeah but i would tell but i would cheer people on you know i mean there's no money in it yeah but there's a you know <laughs> the human reward of watching somebody just grow and be you know become what that's that's the real payoff it is it's addictive talk about addiction that's it's addictive. It's a better form. Better watch, form. Watch people yeah. like discover. It is amazing. Things. It is so rewarding. Yeah, it's crazy. And you can't yeah. count it in your bank account. It's a. Mm -mm. It's a. It's it's beyond that. It, it it supersedes all that. What would you What would you tell a help giver that might be you know leading some encouragement out there that might be weary and you know trying to help people? What would you say, Janice? I would just tell them to hang in there. Just keep moving forward. Stop looking backwards. We have a tendency to keep looking back or dwelling on what we did have or what we could have had or if I could have, should have, would have. You can't do that to yourself. You just got to keep your eye on the prize. And the prize is you. You're the most precious thing. Life is the most precious thing that you could ever have. That is beautiful. Yeah. Well, well, you two wonderful souls, I want to thank you both for being here and sharing your story, sharing encouragement, and unpacking this thing of 
you know, connection and the power that can come from it. Your story of how you how you ch- help change the trajectory of lives, uh, both with you and and your husband, and uh, also with what's happened since. How you've Janice now have taken that and have paid it forward so richly as you're still doing that. And so we just want to thank you for joining us and being a part of this podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Great hanging out with you for a minute. <laughs> Absolutely, Dave Beatty. <laughs> I always called you by your full name. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I love you. Wonderful. You. Thank you, guys. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. God, bless. God bless. Wow. What a powerful episode. I think this story really proves something that Michael said. When we're apart, we're weaker. But when we're together, we're stronger. Look at the life that Janice is leading today. Able to give back and help others and enjoy these renewed relationships with her children and family. Look at David, who's now paid to do this kind of work that helps so many. Please subscribe and let us know what you thought of the episode in the comments below. And until the next time, go and live an altered life.